Welcome to video podcast number 19. Um, let me see what I want to start off with. Oh, well, most of this is going to be replying to some feedback I got in response to an article that was just posted today on O'Shea Duke Jackson's site. Um, the Negro Manosphere dot com, which I've been writing articles for every Monday, and my article today wasn't anything you know out of the ordinary or complex. It was simply about the nature of my my book Mo One, which of course is all about upfront, specific, straightforwardly honest verbal communication. And even though it was just published this morning, I've already received quite a few emails and inbox messages regarding my article. Uh, as always, first I want to give shout outs to all my Patreon.com supporters. I am going to be finding a way in the next few days to upload the videos that are listed as paid content. If you're a Patreon subscriber, a Patreon of mine, I'm going to make sure that you're able to see those for free. Uh, if you've already, you know, signed up as a Patreon subscriber. Uh, somebody told me about a way where you can invite specific YouTube users to look at videos because the thing is with a lot of my paid content some of you all in certain countries cannot buy or rent my videos like YouTube has a certain list of countries it makes available and if, if you live in a country that's not on that list then you, you can't purchase the video either for rental or for purchase um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I'll keep you updated on the ways I'm going to get around that. And like I said, I want to make it so that my Patreon subscribers can see all my videos for free since they're donating, uh, offering financial support to me. And I appreciate everybody who offers financial support either via PayPal or via Patreon. I, I really appreciate you. Um, let me see. As always, leave feedback in the comments section below, below, excuse me, comment section below, as well as you can write me at YouTube at mode1.net, M-O-D-E-O-N-E.net, or you can write me through one of my two Facebook pages, either my public Facebook page or my personal Facebook page. Um... Let's see. Oh, quick note. Um, and I've had this happen from time to time ever since probably like 2007, 2008. As you know, I offer email consultations, I offer Skype and telephone consultations, and I offer one on one face to face coaching sessions. All of those are different. All of those serve different needs. So, for example, what I've had happen recently, and maybe I'll, I'll take a lot of blame for this, that maybe I don't make this as clear on my website as I need to, but some of you all will pay for an email consultation, and then you will send me like, three, four, five, six paragraphs worth of questions. That's not for email consultations. If you have that much content you want to cover, that's when you need to purchase a Skype or telephone consultation. Now, obviously, if you live in another country, I only do Skype. I can do just audio only via Skype or audio and video. 90% of the time I do audio and video over Skype. 
uh, if you live in the United States, you can choose to do Skype or telephone. I will call you usually from a block number and we can talk. But yeah, man, I mean, I know a lot of you guys mean well and you didn't do it to try to, you know, cheat me or whatever. But yeah, man, for future reference, man, email consultations are for when you get like a real quick question or two. Like, Alan, I was reading chapter five and Mo one and there was this one paragraph that left me kind of confused. Can you clarify this for me? Or Alan, I went out with this chick on last Friday and I said this, she said that and it kind of left me a little puzzled and confused on her response to what I said. Can you give me some insight? That's what email consultation is for. It's real quick questions, real quick clarifications, that sort of thing. You don't buy a, a email consultation and then give proceed to give me like your life story. Like like I've had some guys, they'll send me emails, man. It looks like a, a PhD dissertation or something. And have like 15 paragraphs in it, man. No, man. I, I, you know, now some of you guys, I've been nice enough to go ahead and reply. And I gave you a warning through email. But I'm telling you guys now, those who've never purchased from me before, when it comes to my email consultations, man, don't send me no real lengthy questions or comments or, or your life story. If you want detailed, if you got to cover something that's lengthy and detailed, that's when you need to do one or more Skype consultations with me slash telephone consultations with me. Or in some cases, a one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching session you know remember how I said that this if this hand represents where you want to be I said that I have different clients um, wait no let, let's say this hand Let's say my right hand is represents where you ultimately want to be and where I ultimately want you to be in terms of your confidence, your verbal communication skills, and just your comprehension of my mode one principles and philosophies. The difference in my clients is I have some clients this far away from where they want to be, this far away, this far away, this far away, this far away, this far away. Honestly, if you're this far away, you shouldn't depend on email consultations. You need at minimum Skype slash telephone consultations or one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching. If you're maybe this far away or this far away, wait, I'm messing up my hands. You know, in other words, relatively close. You just need, again, some quick questions answered, some quick clarifications, some tweaking here and there. That's what email consultations are for. You should be asking me no more than two questions in an email consultation. Preferably just one. At most two. But if you got like 15 questions asked me, you can't purchase a two email exchange and then ask me 15 questions. What you're basically trying to do is you're trying to cheat me out of money. And quite frankly, I don't appreciate that. And again, I, I don't think some of you guys do that intentionally or maliciously. But yeah, man, you, you can't do that, man. You can't ask me multiple questions. Again, each email exchange, like I have three packages. I have two email exchanges, five email exchanges, and ten email exchanges. And if you say purchase a two email consultation at two exchanges, you can't ask me 20 questions in those two emails. Hell no. You need to buy 10 email exchange if you got as many as 20 questions. Again, an email consultation is for one at max two questions. One at max two questions. If you got more than two questions, then either A, you need to buy a multiple exchange email consultation, 
or B, you need to purchase a Skype or telephone consultation. And again, if you're at like what I call base zero, where I'm working from you like, like you just like totally clueless about women and you really need me to school you, then that's when you need to purchase a one-on-one -on -one face to face consultation. As well as if you want, you know, a lot of my verbal seduction skills and techniques and um, recognizing body language techniques, all that type of thing. That's when you need to do one on one face to face. Like I got a couple of those coming up in Los Angeles later on this month. But um yeah man, so anyway. You know, it's not that high of a percentage of guys that are guilty of what I'm talking about, but it's enough. Um, this one, I don't like, again, I always say I don't like to predict the length of my video podcast, but this one shouldn't be too lengthy. It shouldn't be over an hour. Because, again, this is mainly just going to be a follow-up to the article I wrote. You can find the link to today's article below in the comments section below. Um... Okay, so I'm going to talk to a lot of you guys as if you're totally ignorant to the world of pickup artists, dating coaches, seduction guru, and, um, and what's known as the attraction and seduction industry or the pickup artist community, or simply the seduction community. Oh, first off, I want to give my uh, my prayers and uh, condolences to anybody who might have had friends or relatives harmed or injured in that uh, attack in London. I'm kind of surprised that there's been all these terrorist attacks in London. And... Um, I feel bad any time a terrorist attack takes place. But it just shows you the world we live in, man. It's a lot of people in the world that are angry about something, bitter about something, resentful about something. So, some of that is going to relate to what I'm going to talk about in this video podcast, man. You know, people being just angry and, and bitter and <laughs> resentful about shit, man. To the point where they want to kill people. You know, or some people have some kind of vengeance they're seeking against people who they feel did them wrong. It's just the world we live in, man. Um, so anyway, I hope anybody that I'm familiar with who lives in the United Kingdom and specifically London uh, was not harmed or did not have any close friends or relatives that were harmed in any type of way. Um... Okay, now, obviously, shit, I want to say even before, I would say going all the way back to my college days, even before I knew anything about, you know, I don't think at that point there was anything resembling a seduction community or attraction and seduction industry or pickup artist community. And even though I didn't use the terms direct, versus indirect in that way back then in college, you're talking about the early, mid-80s. Even back in my college days, guys, like some of my close friends and frat brothers used to debate me on the notion of Mo One, even though I didn't call it that in college. As you know, I didn't start calling my behavior, my straightforward behavior Mo One until October of 1990. But Back in like 1985, 86, around there, I had friends and fraternity brothers that debated the idea of telling the woman straightforwardly what your sexual desires, interests, and intentions are, particularly if your objective was to have casual sex with them. Here's a simple thing, man. Some people believe in being full of shit, period. You know, I've talked about it in previous video podcasts. You got a lot of guys out here. I wrote this article one time for the examiner.com. It was it was what I called, I said a lot of men choose to go through either the front door, the side door, or the back door. 
when it comes to getting a woman in bed. And I know at least a handful of people who use those terms like I do. And that's related to being direct versus indirect. What I call going through the front door would simply be being mode one. When you, when you let a woman know up front, specifically and straightforwardly, that you want to have sex with her, and you're not wasting time with any type of, you know, flattering and entertaining small talk, then I call that, number one, being mode one, and more informally, going through the front door. Side door would be similar to mode two. When you're going through the side door to get a woman in bed, what that basically means is you're going the roundabout way. You're trying to first make sure you flatter a woman, make sure you entertain a woman, make sure you make her feel comfortable in your presence, make sure you reveal a lot of biographical information about yourself and or find out biographical information about her and in many ways you're trying to somehow impress her in some kind of way and then after you feel like you've accomplished all those objectives then you slowly but surely in a vague ambiguous beat around the bush way let a woman know that you want to have sex with her. In the back door would be something really unethical like rape, date rape, getting a woman sloppy drunk and then taking advantage of her or putting drugs in her food and drinks or at minimum just blatantly lying to her you know about your intentions that, that was what I call a backdoor method so again you can either go through the front door the side door or the back door and again as you all know I'm all about that front door man Uh, now, as far as since I've been a professional dating coach, um, yeah, you know, I've been on bit various message boards where people would try to challenge the idea of being direct. And what I argue is simply this, and if you read more one already, you already know. To me, there's, it, there's only two, two to three main reasons why men are not direct. Two to three main reasons why men are not direct. Number one is a profound fear of rejection. Period. That's the number one, hands down, the number one reason why men will choose verbally communicating their desires in more of an indirect manner than a direct manner. Because they, they not only when I say they're scared of rejection, but more specifically, as I said in my article today, they're scared of abrupt rejection like immediate straightforward rejection some people some guys again they I, I mentioned this in I think my very last video podcast some guys can't handle rejection George Sodini the guy who shot up them people in, in Pittsburgh or suburb of Pittsburgh perfect example he couldn't handle being rejected by multiple women Elliot Roger that guy was only like 21 22 years old you wouldn't think somebody that young would be frustrated with being rejected or ignored by women. But that's why he killed, I think it was six or seven people. Because he, and see, and he, Elliot Roger, if you do your research on him, he proves what I've always been saying about how money and material possessions is overrated. Because this dude was driving a BMW, his parents were rich, his father was some rich studio executive in Hollywood. He had all the material shit, but he couldn't get no pussy. So he went and killed some people and then killed himself. He couldn't handle rejection. A lot of guys can't handle rejection, man. That's just the reality, man. And even the guys, a lot of guys who don't go out, you know, looking to murder people or do these murder suicides, there's a lot of people who, plain and simply, man, egotistically, they cannot handle being sexually, romantically, and sexually rejected by women. I'm similar to Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan said one time in an interview, they asked him about losing. 
because he's so, he's so ultra competitive when he was playing, as many athletes are. And Michael Jordan says something that I, I have a similar attitude when it comes to women. He said in regards to in regards to basketball, Michael Jordan said, "I don't like losing." He said, "Matter of fact, I hate losing. Absolutely hate losing." But he said, "I'm not afraid to lose." Let me repeat that. He said, I don't like losing. Matter of fact, I hate losing, but I'm not afraid to lose. He said, because when you're afraid to lose, that's when you're not going to take the necessary actions to win. For He said, the best example would be taking like a game-winning shot. If you're scared to lose, you're not going to have the confidence to take a game-winning shot because you're going to be afraid if that shot don't go in, that you're going to be criticized by the fans, you're going to be booed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They say you can never, if you call yourself a true winner and a true competitor, you can never be afraid to lose. Everybody who's competitive hates to lose, especially on a professional level. Like I remember Larry Bird, who used to play in the NBA, said one time. He said, "He said I really don't enjoy winning." He said a lot of people talk about enjoyment of winning. He said I don't enjoy winning. He said I just hate losing. <laughs> I thought that was funny because a lot. I think a lot of competitive people can relate to that. He was like, "When I win, there's no particular joy associated with it." He said, "My biggest thing, I just hate losing." But um. Again, I have similar sentiments to Michael Jordan as it relates to women. I don't like being rejected. If I'm really attracted to a woman, I would probably argue that I hate being rejected. But I'm not scared to be rejected. That's the difference. I'm not scared to be rejected. A lot of guys are scared to be rejected. Not only would I say they dislike it or even possibly hate it, but they're scared of it. I always use this analogy that a lot of guys pretend like their ego is a big Snickers bar in their head. And that if they get rejected, that a woman is going to lean her head into their... <laughs> that a woman is going to lean, lean her big chompers, her teeth into their head and take a big bite out of that Snickers bar like... <sighs> That's how some men treat rejection. Like, oh shit, please don't take that bite out out of my head, don't take that bite off my Snickers bar, call my ego. I ain't scared of rejection, man. And that's why I'm so direct, because here's my thing, man, and a lot of this is going to be repetitive from some of my previous video podcasts, and definitely if you've read my books, and ebooks, paperbacks, and listened to my audiobooks, but <laughs> women I know I've repeated this a number of times, man. See, here's the problem with a lot of you guys. A lot of you guys think you can earn brownie points with women that's going to lead to a woman having sex with you. And I'm here to tell you that that's bullshit. Okay? That's bullshit. Like, for example, a lot of you guys think if you take a woman out to dinner three times in a row at a five-star restaurant that she's going to be more motivated to have sex with you, and I'm telling you that that's bullshit. Or if you bring flowers to her on the first date, the de and some kind of nice, cute card, that she's going to be more motivated to have sex with you, and I'm telling you that that's bullshit. That's bullshit, man. Women know within the first 15 minutes or less after they meet you if they're going to have sex with you or not. Period. In the story. Uh, see, a lot of you guys think you can, you guys who favor indirect methods, think you can persuade women to have sex with you. No, you can't. That's bullshit. If a woman is flat out, 100% not interested in having sex with you, there is nothing you can do to change her mind. Nothing. And again, that's why, excuse me, burp number two. Oh, you know I got to take my you know, break. My second favorite flavor. 
You know, they keep in my grocery store, my local grocery store, they keep running out of my favorite flavor, strawberry lemonade. It's called Shine. Piss. Last like three times I went there, man, it was sold out. That's why when I do find it on the shelf, I buy like about 30 bottles, man, because they be selling out. And I know somebody right pissed at me. They're like, man, that black guy came in the store. He bought like 30 bottles of Shine. I love Shine, but this is my, my close second favorite. It, as you know, is lemon squeeze. So, excuse me. But yeah, any of you who read my original ebook or original paperback of Mo One, I want to say it's a, as early as in the introduction if not the chapter one, one of those two, it's any, either the introduction or chapter one. I, I, I make this comment, I can't remember my exact words, but it's to the fact that I said to eliminate any chance accusations of unsubstantiated hype. Because see, here's my thing with me. Because I know there's a lot of pickup artists and dating coaches that will lead you to believe that if you follow my advice, if you follow my methods, if you use my techniques, if you absorb my philosophies and principles, you will be able to seduce any woman you meet, guaranteed, or your money back. See, I ain't gonna never tell you guys no bullshit like that. I, I'm never, ever, ever going to offer any guarantee that if you follow all of my advice, you read all of my books and absorb all of my principles and philosophies that you'll be able to seduce every woman you meet or any woman you meet. Because that's bullshit. That's straight up bullshit. Now, the closest I will come to guaranteeing something like that is I will guarantee you, I always say I guarantee two things if you follow my more one advice. If you're more one with a woman that's a reciprocator or a wholesome pretender slash erotic hypocrite, then yes, I would say that 99.9% .9 chance you should end up in bed with that woman if she's a reciprocator or a wholesome pretender slash erotic hypocrite. And on the flip side, I virtually guarantee that if you're more one with a woman and you're dealing with a rejector or a manipulative time waster, summertime, outside noise. If you're dealing with a woman that's a rejector or a manipulative time waster, that you won't get laid with that woman, but at least you won't waste any significant amount of time and or money pursuing that woman's sexual companionship. So here's the basic deal, man. You know, I, I think most of you watching me right now understand this. So, I'm, you know, I'm really preaching to the choir. But for you small percentage of guys who don't, you cannot convert a rejector into a reciprocator. It's impossible. And see, a lot of p other pickup artists, particularly those who endorse indirect methods, will try to make you believe that. They'll try to make you believe that if you if if you follow their advice, that you can turn a, re a rejector into a reciprocator. And I'm telling you right now, that's bullshit, man. If a woman is just flat out not interested in having sex with you, I don't care if you offer her flowers, if you uh, do something nice for her, if you compliment her a lot, if you take her to a bunch of fancy restaurants, that chick still ain't. She's not gonna suck your dick, and she's not gonna give you any pussy. Now, some guys might say, okay, Alan, what about women? What about if I offer a woman $1,000? I bet you that, that'll change a rejector into a reciprocator. Yes and no. Yes and no. Here's the deal. Money does not make a woman become genuinely interested in you sexually. Surely, if you guys have, have paid money for a street prostitute, a professional call girl, an erotic escort, I want to say if you're smart and you're intelligent and you're not super naive, I hope you realize that the women you pay money to have sex with you do not genuinely want to have sex with you. See, if a woman genuinely wants to have sex with you, she's not going to charge you money for it. Period. That's what, what I refer to as genuine sexual interest. Gen, when a woman is genuinely interested in having sex with you, 
You're not going to have to jump through any hoops or pay a woman any, spend any money on a woman in order to get some pussy from her. If you have to give a woman a thousand dollars in order for her to have sex with you, what that means is that a woman is going to fake sexual interest in you in order to take your money. Period. That's what that is, man. That's not genuine sexual interest. That's a woman, that's what I would call manipulative sexual interest. Materialistic and manipulative. Like, there's a lot of married women. Now, I mentioned this in one of my previous podcasts. There's a lot of women who are married to guys. Let me repeat that. There's a lot of women who are married to guys that they have no sexual attraction to whatsoever. But those guys are offering them financial security. So what they do is they fake orgasms. They fake an interest in having sex with them in order to get that man's shit, in order to gain access to that man's financial resources and material possessions. Now, I can't speak for some of you guys. Some of you guys might be like, well, I don't care, man. I don't care if a woman ain't really into me. I still want to fuck her. See, I, that's where I'm different than a lot of you guys. I don't really enjoy fucking a woman if I get the sense that she's not genuinely interested in having sex with me. If I get if, if a woman gives me the sense that either she's not interested in having sex with me at all, or that she's only interested in having sex with me in order to get something out of me, then I, I lose interest in having sex with her. You know, I ain't got time for that shit. I'm all about identifying genuine sexual sexual interests in a woman. Now here's the dumbest argument I hear from a lot of you guys. The what gotta be like the dumbest argument I hear. Hey Alan, like my mother and my sisters told me that if you talk about sex to a woman, you're gonna turn her off sexually. Think about that statement for a second. I want you to just marinate on that for a few seconds. Okay, are you done marinating on that? Okay, do you do you now consciously realize how ridiculous that statement is? That you will turn a woman off sexually by talking about sex? That would be like if I was a chef at a restaurant and I told my waiters and waitresses, hey, don't talk about food with the customers because that would turn them off from wanting to eat the food. Don't talk about food. That that would turn them off. Or if I was the owner of a car dealer and I told my car salesman, "Hey, don't don't talk about automobiles with the customers, because that would turn them off from wanting to buy a car." If you talk about automobiles, do you do you realize how fucking stupid that is? I mean, really, do you realize how fucking stupid that is? I was, sometimes I man, when I've had guys tell me that in person, I literally wanted to just bitch slap them for even just uttering that shit to me. That is like the dumbest fucking shit you could ever say to somebody. I did it a couple of times. I literally walked away from guys when they said that. Like my brother, he's, he's my older brother about that. Like my brother, he's a character, man. When we were young, my brother was the type that if you said something like just stupid to him, he wouldn't insult you or yell at you. Or, he would just literally just walk away from you. He would just, he would just walk away from you. Because he, he didn't like people saying just stupid shit. And I've done that on occasion myself, man. And like there's a couple times when guys said that shit to me, that very comment like, Hey Alan, like, you know, my older sister said that, you know, you shouldn't talk to talk to women about sex. Because they get turned off if you, if you talk. How can a woman get turned off sexually? by you talking about sex if she's interested in you. That don't even make sense. I mean seriously, that don't even make sense. That don't, that be, I mean, to me if you're like in the sixth grade you should be able to understand that that don't make sense. If a woman gets turned off by you talking about sex, that means she's not interested in having sex with you. 
That don't mean that she's not interested in having sex, period. That means she's not interested in having sex with you. I mean, turn that around. Think of a woman, a woman that you just find repulsively unattractive that approached you and start talking about sex. Would you be turned on by her talking about sex if you were repulsively unattractive, found her repulsively unattractive? Hell no. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want no woman that you're just completely 100% not attracted to to be talking to you about, you know, you going down on her or you having intercourse with her or even her performing oral sex on you. You would be like, ugh. You think women are different? <laughs> well, what would make you think women are not the same way? If a woman's not attracted to you sexually, of course she's going to be turned off by you talking about sex. Of course she is. Duh! And the secondary thing that some women will be turned off by, and I've talked about this in previous audio and video podcasts, Let's say you meet a woman that does have some degree of sexual interest in you, but she wants to spend time with you both sexually and non-sexually. But you give her the impression that you only want to spend time with her strictly sexually. Then yeah, that woman is going to be turned off to some degree because she's not turned off about the sexual component. She's turned off by the fact that you don't want to spend time with her non-sexually. I wouldn't so much call that turned off as much as I would call it egotistically frustrated or agitated. A lot of women get agitated. That's the very reason why you have a lot of wholesome pretenders. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm going to make that a paid content video podcast coming up soon, specifically about wholesome pretenders. But in a nutshell, that's the main basis for why you have women who I refer to as wholesome pretenders and erotic hypocrites. Wholesome pretenders, are, in a nutshell, are women who are interested in having sex with a guy who they're talking to, but their first preference is they want that guy, both that guy's sexual and non-sexual companionship. They don't want just that guy's strictly sexual companionship. So when you let a wholesome pretender know that you just want casual sex, or that you just want to spend time with them sexually, yeah, they're going to pretend like they're turned off. And again, it's not so much I would call it turned off as much as they're pissed off that you don't want to spend time with them non-sexually. But again, any woman who is genuinely interested in having sex with you doesn't get turned off by you talking about sex. That's like oxymoronic to even suggest. That's like a woman who loves a suck dick being turned off by you talking about sucking dick. I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Please don't be that, that ignorant and stupid and oxymoronic. Why would a woman who loves to suck dick get turned off by you talking about sucking dick? Why would a woman who loves to have her pussy licked get turned off by you talking about licking pussy? Why would a woman who loves to get fucked doggy style get turned off by you talking about fucking her doggy style. That don't even make sense, man. Again, man, wholesome pretenders will pretend to be turned off to pr protect their innocent, wholesome public image. But, and also, if a woman's just flat out not attracted to you, she's going to be turned off by any type of sex talk. But I can speak for myself, man. I've never had a woman that was genuinely interested in having sex with me that got turned off by sex talk, ever. Again, at, at, at best, or I should say at worst, I've had wholesome pretenders spend a few minutes or a few hours or even a few days sometimes pretending like they got turned off by my sex talk, but after I fucked them, they admitted that later on. Those wholesome pretenders would admit that. They would say, Alan, I was just acting like I was turned off. I can't tell you how many wholesome pretender types and erotic hypocrite types told me that after we fucked. They'll say, yeah, Alan, I knew when I first met you that I wanted to give you some pussy. You had my pussy dripping wet. But I had to pretend like I got turned off because of my 
they wouldn't say social programming, but essentially what they, in so many words, they would say because of my social programming. And again, I don't want to go into detail about that. I'm going to charge you guys money to go into detail about that. But um, I remember if I had to highlight three guys, a lot of times I don't highlight people by name on my video podcast. But I'm going to highlight three people by name, other dating coaches, who, who have publicly challenged me under the category of direct versus indirect. First guy off the top of my head I remember was a guy named Paul Janka. You can Google him. J-A-N-K-A. Paul Janka. I interviewed him on my blog talk radio show. He was, he, he fancied himself as New York City's top pickup artist. He was on the Today Show. He did the whole TV, you know, market for a while. You know, so he got a lot of, you know, mainstream media publicity. But yeah, I had him on my show, man. And he said, I thought he knew about my Mo One principles and philosophies before he got on the show. But obviously he didn't. So we were chopping up game. And when I told him the essence of Mo One, he said, wait a minute. You verbally let women know that you want to fuck them before you fuck them? I was like, hell yeah, that's what Mo One is all about. He was like, oh, hell no. He said, that's dating suicide. I said, well, what do you do? Because, see, one of the reasons I invited him on my show was because a couple of my followers told, had given me the misleading impression that he was direct. But he went on to say, he said, no, I never tell women verbally that I want to have sex with them before I have sex with them. I said, then what do you do then? He said... What I do is I'll meet a woman at like a bar or a nightclub, you know, have drinks with her, and then I'll invite her to my place or suggest that we go back to her place. And then once we're at her place or my place, I just start making moves on her. I just start, you know, making physical sexual advances on her. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I mean, we both were treating each other's philosophy with an attitude like, are you serious? Like... With him, he treated me like that, like, are you serious? You verbally tell women ahead of time you want to have sex with them? And when he said that he just invites women over his place to make moves on them, I was like, are you serious? See, man, I'm telling tell you, fellas, man, there was a time when you can get away with that. I would say, matter of fact, during when, the time when I was in college, in most of the 80s, you can get away with that, man. Like, for example, <laughs> when I was in college, man, I don't, I don't necessarily want to bring race into the issue, but inevitably I probably am. But when I was in college, I was in a predominantly African-American fraternity called Kappa Alpha Psi. As you know, that's what this date on the top of my head is the date that my fraternity was founded. And one of the things we used to do every so many weeks or every so many months is we would give a joint party with a predominantly Caucasian fraternity at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. I think we had like, during the time I was there, we must have had like at least three, as many as four or five, but I want to say at least three. We had these joint parties. Anyway, so I'm talking to this dude from the white fraternity and he sees me basically being mo one with this chick. I was whispering in her ear, basically talking shit to her. And he was watching me from a couple feet away. So after I was, you know, finished talking to her, he said, hey, he's kind of inebriated. Not sloppy drunk, but he had a buzz. But he was like, hey, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He's like, what was with all that whispering in that woman's ear, man? Like, what were you saying to her, man? I was like, oh, man, I was, you know, talking shit to her. I was with the objective of getting her pussy wet. He said, getting her pussy wet? He said, how can you get a woman's pussy wet without fingering her? I said, oh, I gave him a look like, shit, you don't know Al Curry. You don't know Alan Roger Curry. But in a nutshell, I told him, I said, I know how to talk dirty to women and get their pussy wet. And he was amazed. He was like, wait a minute. You can just talk to women? and get their pussy wet? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, get the fuck out of here. And I was like, okay. I was like, okay, so let me ask you. How do you get women's pussy wet? I mean, how do you go about fucking women? 
He said what all guys do in fraternities. And I think what he really meant to say was what all guys do in white fraternities. But I don't want to generalize again. I don't want to generalize fraternity guys by race. But anyway, he went on to say, he said, dude, our main method of getting women in bed is we, get them, we give them as many beers as possible. You see, you see all these keggers? I don't know if a lot of you guys know what a kegger is. A kegger is like this big, gigantic container, metal container that has beer in it. And it has this siphon that if you're on a college campus like at a lot of fraternity parties, they'll have keggers where you siphon the beer into this plastic cup and shit as opposed to giving everybody, you know, bottles of beer or, or cans of beer. So anyway, he went on to say, he said, man... He said, most of the guys in my fraternity, we, our objective as far as for casual sex is to get a woman sloppy drunk and then just fuck them. And see, again, and if you listen to my interview with this chick named Katie Costner on Blog Talk Radio, look it up in my Blog Talk Radio archives. She's a woman. Now, this woman I just mentioned, Katie Costner, She's the one who made the term date rape famous. She was on the cover of Time magazine. She's like the, you could say she's literally the face of date rape. Like, I wouldn't say she was the first woman to be date rape. Date rape was happening before she came forward with her stories. But people didn't really use that term. Like, like for you young people, you probably hear that term all the time now. Like when I was young, like say in high school and college, nobody used the term date rape. There was only rape, but nobody used the term date rape. They didn't start, I want to say the first time I was used was actually again when Katie Costner brought that forward. She, she came forward in this story that was in Time Magazine and she said that one of her college classmates had date raped her. But... As much as I don't want to cast dispersions on these fraternity guys, that's essentially what these guys were endorsing, man. They were endorsing the idea of getting a woman sloppy drunk and then just taking advantage of her, man. I got to be real, man. I've said this before, man. I don't have a daughter, at least that I know of. But if I had a daughter, and that's the way somebody got my daughter in bed by getting her sloppy drunk, I just have to risk going to prison, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that light hardly. I would have to risk going to prison because I would try to find that motherfucker and kill him. Or if not kill him, at least rough him up in a major fucking way. I'm not cool. I'm going to tell you, I got to go on a side note here, a little preaching, I guess you can call it. But, dude, I'm not down with fucking women by means of drugs and or alcohol. I mentioned that on my blog talk radio show many times. I mentioned it in at least one or two of my books. And I want to say I've mentioned it in at least one, maybe two video podcasts. But dude, I'm not down with that shit. I'm not down with that shit at all, man. I, especially if you're talking about the very first time having sex. Like I, somebody sent me this article where this pickup artist was actually bragging. I want to say he lived in San Diego. And he was bragging on the fact that he met a woman at a club who was just sloppy drunk. He took her back to his apartment and then he fucked her. And he had the nerve to label that seduction. Are you serious? I mean, really, are you serious? There's nothing, nothing about getting a woman drunk and having sex with her that is representative of seduction. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. No, nah, man. I actually, I, I mean, when I lived in Los Angeles, I had a close friend. I prevented him from doing that. I mean, we was coming from this club, man. And there was these uh, three sisters walking in front of us, and at least two of the three sisters, you, we could tell by the way they was walking that they had too much alcohol. And a buddy of mine, man, he just approached the woman, he just started, first he talked to her for a few seconds, then he just started kissing her, man. And when they got to the woman's car, he was about to fuck on the front hood of her car, man. 
And I stopped him. And at first, he got mad. I stopped him. I said, dude, what the fuck are you doing? He said, what does it look like I'm doing? He said, I'm going to fuck this bitch, man. I said, dude, so you're just going to date rape this chick? And he said, come again? I said, so you're just going to date rape this chick? I said, dude, look at this chick, man. She don't know what the fuck she doing. She not in her right frame of mind. Are you going to seriously fuck this woman and she doesn't know what the fuck is going on and she got at least one friend that's watching this that from all accounts is relatively sober? You don't think this woman is, could charge you with date rape tomorrow? Unfortunately, he thought about it. He said, damn. He said, Alan, I think you're right, man. Because at first he was pissed, but then when he thought about it, he said, I think you're right. He said, yeah. Then he stopped. Dude, that's what, why do you think date rape is such a big deal now? Why do you think that shit is such a big deal now, man? See, again, man, in my era, my college era, a lot of guys got away with that shit, man, just simply getting a woman sloppy drunk and then fucking her. But now I guarantee you, mark my words if you want to challenge me on this, I guarantee you, go ahead and get a woman sloppy drunk and fuck her and see don't you, you get a fucking date rape charge. I guarantee, if, if it ain't 100% guarantee, at bare minimum, it's a 50 to 60% chance that woman's going to accuse you of date rape the next day. I guarantee you that shit. That's, that's why that shit is popping off like popcorn all over the country at these college campuses while you got all these women saying these guys are date raping me, man. I don't play that shit, man. Like, I remember, I, t I think I mentioned this, a good friend of mine, his name is Dante Nero, man. We got into this lighthearted debate on his show and when he was on my show, because I was a guest on his show and he was a guest on my show. He used to be uh, the comedian Patrice O'Neill's best friend. And he teased me one time about Mo One. He said, Alan, I like Mo One, man, but he said, you don't give women room for plausible deniability. And I said, exactly. And he said, oh, man, no, nah, you got to give women some degree of plausible deniability. And see, I don't know if he specifically brought up alcohol, but that's why, you know, like Jamie Foxx has a song called Blaming on the Alcohol. Blaming on the Alcohol. Forget how it goes. Anyway, yeah, look it up on YouTube or, or Google. You got a song called Blaming on Alcohol. And I remember that I was on AskMan.com, and these women said that. These women said, Alan, the only way I'll have casual sex with men is if I have some type of plausible deniability. And I, I want to say at the time they said it, I didn't really know what that meant. I wasn't familiar with that term. And I said, what do you mean plausible den deniability? And they said, oh, for example, a guy would have to put alcohol in my system before I had casual sex with him. Because then the next day I can simply say the only reason I had sex with that guy is because I was drunk. And that's when I told them. I told these women. I said, oh, I would never do that. I said, I would never want women to use alcohol as an excuse for having sex with me. And these women, they were like, well, then you wouldn't have casual sex with us. Because that's the only way we would have casual sex with guys if they got us drunk. But see, that's a double-edged sword. These women are saying plausible deniability is a guy's end for having casual sex with them. But what I'm telling you, if you want to take my advice and listen to me is, in this day and age, if you use that technique, you are asking for a date rape charge. You are asking for a date rape charge. Because if a woman is able to prove that she never gave you any type of verbal consent to fuck her, she got grounds for a date rape charge. Now just because she charges you with date rape doesn't automatically mean you're going to go to prison for it. You would have to go to trial and all that shit to be convicted. But I'm, as far as just her being able to charge you with date rape, if a woman can prove that she never said, yes, I want you to fuck me, then she can charge you with date rape. That's why, man, when I'm having phone sex with women and when I'm having physical sex with women, I make women say that shit. I'll say, tell daddy you want me to fuck you. And they'll say, yeah, daddy, I want you to fuck me. And I'll say, say it again. And they say, yeah, daddy, I want you to fuck me. Uh, that ain't just me talking dirty. That's me making those women give me consent, man. 
I don't, I don't, I don't joke around with that consent shit, dog. I've never had a date rape charge ever. I've never had a woman charge me with date rape ever. Now, there's some dating coaches. I am not gonna say their name, although you could say technically I already did say one guy's name. That if you Google their names and put in date rape behind it, I'll say no more. So anyway, one was Paul Janka. He argued, he debated me on the idea of being verbally direct versus being verbally indirect. Oh, it looks like I'm going to go over an hour. I said this wasn't going to be over an hour. Well, fuck it. Um, for those of you who attended the very first direct dating summit in London, when I spoke in London in November 2010, if you were there in the auditorium, <laughs> Ah, let me take a swig. Hold on, hold that thought. If you were in the auditorium when I spoke in London, you know who I had somewhat of a, a verbal exchange with. It wasn't too harsh, actually. It wasn't too heated. But I'll say this, my rebuttal to his criticism made the audience laugh so hard that he got up and left the auditorium. So you could say, I embarrassed that motherfucker out, out of the auditorium. And that was his home turf. He was considered the top pickup artist in London. How you gonna let a motherfucker from the States, as, as the Brits call us, the States, how you gonna let one of those arrogant American motherfuckers from the States Come over to the UK, come over to London, and fade you on your home turf, man. Man, if I was speaking in New York or Chicago, Los Angeles, I ain't gonna let nobody from another country, another dating culture pickup artist fade me. Are you serious? Shit. That will never happen. Ever. I faded this dude on his own turf. Yeah, I'm gonna say his name. Yad. Y A D. Yad. All you guys in London know who Yad is, and other places in Europe know who Yad is. But anyway, now we didn't get into any any type of personal exchange, so I don't want to give off that impression. We we didn't. Ours was purely on a philosophical level. I, I try to avoid personal exchanges with other dating coaches and other uh, pickup artists and that type of thing. I, I just feel like that's unnecessary. But now, when it comes to just purely philosophical debates, I, I've had a lot of heated philosophical debates with other dating coaches, pickup artists, seduction gurus. And, um, but yeah, without getting too lengthy story, yeah, yeah, he got on stage and basically said that he thought that the idea of being verbally direct with a woman about your Sexual desires, interests, and intentions was stupid and was representative of dating suicide. And he started emphasizing this concept that a lot of dating coaches and seduction gurus and pickup artists emphasize known as sub-communication. You guys who are real big into the pickup artist industry and the seduction community, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I see a lot of brothers listen to me, they're like, what? What the fuck is that? Because... <laughs> Brothers, most brothers I know, we don't use that type of term, man. Subcommunication. Um, but yeah, a lot of pickup artists, like one guy who I, I was at a direct, another direct dating summit with, uh, I'll say him by name, James Marshall, who a lot of people call the best pickup artist from Australia. He, he, he When he does his speaking engagements, he puts a lot of emphasis on subcommunication. Self communication is basically the same thing as being indirect. Like James Marshall, this is what he believes. He believes that you can be talking to a woman about politics, food, her favorite movies, or the weather, but as long as you're giving her a very seductive stare, a very seductive look, that she'll pick up on the fact that you want to fuck her. And, and, because of that, he doesn't feel there's any need to verbalize your sexual desires, interests, and intentions. And essentially, Yad, I want to say, believes the same thing. All guys 
who believe in subcommunication believe that you should let women know your sexual interests through your your facial expressions, maybe a light touch of your fingers on that woman's arm or hand, basically all types of nonverbal ways. Like there's a guy in the community known as 60 something, 60 years of challenge or something like that. I've had a lot of my followers, they're like, Alan, man. I mean, I love my one, but there's this guy named 60 Years of Challenge, man. He got a lot of followers, and he believes that you should, you can seduce women without verbalizing your sexual desires, interests, and intentions at all. All you do is touch women in a certain way and look at women in a certain way. Here is my response, what it always has been and what it will continue to be. Number one, most women, <laughs> and I say this in more one. Most women know from the time you fucking open a conversation with them that you want to fuck them. Fuck your facial expressions. Fuck you touching them on the hand. Fuck you touching their arm. Like women are fucking stupid. Women know as soon as you flirt with them and talk to them in any social setting that you want to put your dick in their mouth and their pussy. You do, you, do you really think women are that stupid? Come on, man. Wake the fuck up. Like you gotta look at a woman a certain way to let her know you wanna fuck her. Motherfucker, as soon as you open your goddamn mouth, a woman know you wanna fuck her, man. Get the fuck out of here. Some of you are just stupid. God damn it, I hate to call you that, man. I hate to use that word. I don't like to call people stupid. But if you honestly think women don't know you wanna fuck them, you are fucking out of your fucking mind. A woman knows if you just say hello, how you, how's your day going, you want to fuck her. Are you serious? Well, the only exception I would give would be a woman who's just ridiculously naive and inexperienced with men. That would be the only exception. But any other woman, as soon as you smile at them, as soon as you just look at, look at them for more than two or three seconds, they know you want your dick in their mouth or their pussy. Please wake the fuck up for me. So to suggest that, that you need to sub-communicate your desires to a woman to let her know you want to fuck her, man, look at this fucking finger, man. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Second thing on this sub-communication, and I wrote an article uh, on examiner.com about this whole notion of subcommunication. If you really truly believe in subcommunication, then that means you never ever in your life dealt with a woman that was a true attention whore slash cock teaser. It is you 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 let me know. You've never dealt with a woman like that. Because I'm telling you right now, man, if you go and listen to one of my episodes of the erotic conversationalists. There's a woman I interviewed on that show called Crystal, named Crystal. Went by the nickname uh, Nikki True. And we, we actually, usually on my show, the write a conversation, I don't usually talk about stuff to do with, like, a tr direct versus indirect or that type of thing. I usually just talk about fucking. But um, there was at least one interview I did with this chick named Crystal. Well, we, we, during one stretch of that interview, we talked about direct versus indirect. And see, she broke it down for, for people, guys who don't know. Now, she didn't break it down for me because I already knew everything she said. But we, I was asking her, which do you think is more effective? Matter of fact, I brought up Yad to her. I brought up the exchange I had with Yad. And she said, and I'm going to be paraphrasing her words, but she basically said, she said, oh, she said, a guy would have to be verbally direct with me in order to actually fuck me. She said, because if a guy is verbally indirect, I'm just going to cock tease him to death. She said, because if a guy was to rely strictly on nonverbal actions like touching me in a certain way or looking at me, she said, I would just cock tease that motherfucker for hours, days, weeks, months, years. She was like, because I'll let a guy squeeze on my titties 
and squeeze on my ass, but I ain't gonna give him no pussy. She said, I'll let guys kiss on my neck, but I ain't gonna suck their dick. She was like, most women love to cock tease men. She was like, so if a guy ain't verbally direct, he gonna get cock teased to death. And see, that's why I knew immediately when I first started hearing of this concept of subcommunication. And again, for the second time in this conversation, I'm going to bring race into the issue, man. Most black dudes, that's why you ain't going to hear too many black dating coaches or black pickup artists or black seduction gurus talking about no subcommunication. Because black guys know, man, there's too many sisters out here who are cock teasers. I, well, I wouldn't just limit cock teasers to black women. There's women of all races who are attention oars and cock teasers. But I learned that back when I was like, I want to say, in, if not high school, at latest college. Shit, like I used to do that in college. I would invite women to my dormitory room, and I wouldn't say anything verbally. This was before I was Mo one. I would, I would just say, like, say I was at a party, and I would be dancing with this woman, and say I would be grabbing on her ass, you know, grinding on her and shit. And I would say, hey, you want to come back to my dorm room? And she would say, sure. Now, I would think I was automatically going to get the pussy. And sometimes I did. So I wouldn't say I never got the pussy. There were some times when just by inviting a woman to my room, I ended up getting the pussy. But there were a lot of other times where the woman would be like, no, nah, I'm not trying to fuck. You, like, did you invite me to your room thinking we were going to have sex? And I'd be like, well, yeah. They'd be like, oh, no. And I would say, well, damn, I mean, on the dance floor, you know, you let me, like, grab on your ass and shit. And I was, like, kissing on your earlobe and shit. And they, they were basically like, so? You thought that meant that I was going to let you fuck me? Hell no. So, just because a woman will let you do physical shit, like... Like touch on her, and even more specifically, touch on her tits and touch on her ass. Don't mean like you know my infamous story I told. Like somebody asked me, speaking of London, I think it was first in London. Somebody asked me, Alan, since you've been Mo One, have you ever had moments where you regressed back into Mo Two and or Mo Three behavior? And um, and I told him, yeah. I said, sure. There was a few times in my 20s when I did that. But the one time I mentioned on Blog Talk Radio, what I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, I can't think of any other incidents since. So I would say arguably the, last, the very last time that I failed to be Mo 1 with a chick that I wanted to fuck and instead was Mo 2 was roughly 10 years ago. Yeah, it was actually almost 10 years ago to the date. It was May of 2007. See, I remember the month and the year. It was May of 2007. I was at this party. A friend of mine's party. He was giving a birthday party for his wife. And one of his wife's girlfriends had flown in from Pittsburgh. And we start chit-chatting, fluff talk, small talk. Actually, about at least 40 to 50% of the conversation actually was about my book though. Somebody had told her that I was a book author. So we was talking about Mo One. Now see, that's the irony. That's how fucked up my conversation was. I was talking about Mo One, but yet I wasn't being Mo One. So anyway, we chit chatted for at least an hour, if not a little longer. And she said, I'm going to leave this party. I'm, I'm tired of being around a bunch of people. Would you like to go back to my hotel room with me? And I said, sure. Now, see, right there, I should have been Mo One and said specifically, so we going back to your toy room to fuck. But I didn't do that. I just accepted her invitation and went back to the hotel room. And so we talked for maybe, I don't know, five minutes or so. Then we start making out. We start tongue kissing. Now, she let me take off her bra. She let me suck on her tits. So, of course, I'm thinking I'm going to fuck this chick. And then I went to reach my, my finger, the finger fucker, and that's when she she grabbed my wrist. And I looked at her like, <laughs> basically like, bitch, why you grabbing my wrist? And she just shook her head like, mm -mm. She didn't really say anything. She just shook her head like, mm -mm. And so then I kissed, tongue kissed her some more, sucked on her tits some more, and then the second time, I went to finger fucker. And again, she grabbed my wrist. 
I said, okay, what's up? You on like you on your period or something? She said, no. I said, then what's up? She said, you're not my man. And in case you non-black people listen, don't know what that term means. That's black women's way of saying boyfriend. A lot of black women don't say boyfriend. They'll use the term my man, you know, or my dude, or my bae. That's the new thing, my bae, my bae. But yeah, she was like, you're not my man. And I was like, I was basically like, so? <laughs> like, and? She was like, I don't, I don't, I don't do casual sex. And I gave her a look like, like, get the fuck out of here. Like, are you serious? And she was dead serious. She said, I don't, I don't do casual sex. She said, the only way you and I are going to engage in oral sex or intercourse is if we're in a relationship. She said, now I'll let you make out with me. You know, she said, obviously, I'll let you suck on my nipples, and, you know, she said, I'll, I'll let you go that far. But she said, anything beyond that? No, you got to be in a relationship with me. And I told the story on Blog Talk Radio. I actually went into Mo 4 for about three to five minutes. I got pissed. I was like, why the fuck you invite me to your hotel room then? Why the fuck you invite me here if we weren't going to fuck? But then she shut me up real quick. I have to give her kudos. She shut me up. Because seeing this is the weakness of being mold to and being indirect. She said, did I ever say, would you like to come back to my hotel room and fuck me? I don't think I said that, did I? And I, I couldn't even respond back. I, I basically was like, okay, touche. She said, I never ever said that. And she said, if you would have made it clear to me, in other words, she was telling me, if you would have been more one, she said, if you would have made it clear to me before we left the party that that was your specific objective in coming to my hotel room, I would have let you know at the party that I wasn't going to let you fuck me. She said, honestly, I just wanted to come to the hotel room so I can talk to you in a more one-to-one -one manner as opposed to talking to you with people around us. But she said, I never had any intentions of having you come to my hotel room for the sake of fucking me. She said, Are you ask any of my girlfriends, she said, I don't fuck outside the context of a relationship. She said, I only have sex with guys who I'm in a long-term relationship with. She said, again, I'll let you make out with me. She said, I've made out with guys casually, like just tongue kissing and fondling and that type of thing. But she said, I ain't, I don't let no guy fuck me if he ain't my man. And so I said, okay. I said, point taken. I said, it was my bad. I, I explained her about the Mo one verse. I said, bas I, I basically told her, I said, since you know a little bit about my book, I said, I was Mo two with you. I said, and I should have been Mo one. Because I wasn't wasting my motherfucking time. Because I, I said the only reason I came over here was to fuck you. But I didn't tell you that specifically. And she said, yeah, then you wasted both of our time. That was the very last time I was mowed to with a chick. Again, that was 10 years ago. And see, that's what I'm talking about, man. When you're indirect, man, you're assuming that women want to have sex with you. Like I've heard guys say, man, that's all, oh, man. I just invite chicks to my crib. I don't tell them ahead of time that I'm going to fuck them. I'm going to invite them to my crib. Okay, yeah, you continue to do that shit. You go right ahead. And you're probably going to fuck some women doing that. Again, I said this in my last video podcast. I've fucked women being mold 2 before. It ain't like I've never, ever fucked a woman being mold 2 or even mold 3. I've probably two or three women being mold 3 before. So it ain't like I haven't gotten pussy being mold 2. But... The thing about being mo too is that situation I just explained that happened in that hotel room ten years ago. See, that's the type of shit that happens when you mo too, man. That's the type of shit that happens. And that's why I ain't down with being indirect. Cause see, incidents like that leaves me feeling pissed off. Like when I drove home from her hotel room, dude, I was so pissed, man. I was pissed. See, like when I'm mo one with women and I get rejected, I never feel pissed ever, like ever. Never ever. Like people ask me that all the time. They say, Alan, have you ever like left the conversation feeling angry, frustrated, and bitter because a woman rejects you? I said, You mean being rejected because of being mo one or mo two? And they'll say, Okay, mo one. I say, Nope, ever, never. Never ever. There's never been the time. I literally cannot name one woman where I was mo one and that woman rejected me 
And I left the conversation feeling like just agitated or pissed off. But mode two and mode three, man, hell yeah. Like that night I left that woman's hotel room, dude, I drove the whole way driving home to my place. I was pissed. I was pissed at a motherfucker, man. I was like, that bitch wasted my motherfucking time. But then my jail was funny. See, this is going to make me sound weird. But sometimes I have two voices in my head. I don't have what I call my subjective voice and my objective voice. So my subjective voice is the voice that agrees with everything I say. So if I say that woman's a bitch, my subjective voice would be like, yeah, she is a bitch. You're right, Alan, she's a bitch. <laughs> but my objective voice is the voice that I say, no, Alan, you got to be objective here, man. You wouldn't mow one with that chick. You can call her a bitch all you want to, but the fact of the matter is you'll mow two with that chick. You didn't tell her specifically and straightforwardly that you wanted to fuck her in the hotel room. You just accepted the invitation to go. So yeah, man, all you guys who be an indirect, I ain't going to force you to be direct. If you want to be indirect, be my guest. Be my guest. But here's the question you need to ask yourself. Here's what I would say is the ultimate question you need to ask yourself. Is not, can I get laid being indirect? Because I'll give you the simple answer. Yes, you can. Yes, you can get laid being indirect. So it's not an issue of can you get laid. You can get laid being direct or indirect. The question you need to, the more important question you need to ask yourself is, when I'm indirect with women, how do I feel when I get rejected, when I fail to get the pussy, and when I fail to get my dick sucked? That's the question you got to ask yourself. For all you guys who are in favor of more so being indirect and direct, is ask yourself, how do you feel when you get rejected? Particularly after you've invested a significant amount of time, and in some cases time and money. How do you feel when you don't get the pussy? If it don't really bother you, then I would say continue being indirect. That would be my recommendation. Continue being indirect. But see, for a guy like me, and this this goes at why I am more one and why I am favor, why I do favor being direct. Because see, when I'm indirect with women, like the, the scenario I just explained with the woman in the hotel room, when I'm indirect with women and I fail to get the pussy, I feel pissed. I can't speak for all you guys. Some of you guys might be different. You might be like, ah, it don't bother me. But I know me. If I waste more than 10 to 15 minutes with a woman that ain't trying to give me some pussy, I am pissed. I am pissed the fuck off. I'm like, that is 15 minutes of my life that I'm never getting back. I don't even care so much about the money if I happen to spend money. Time is more valuable to me than money. I hate wasting time with a woman that ain't trying to give me no pussy or trying to suck my dick. I can't stand that shit. I ain't even talking about days, weeks, or months. I'm talking about minutes and hours. I don't like to waste time. Again, I literally, I don't like, like I had one guy, he wrote me this week. <laughs> That's one of my clients. He's more hardcore than I am. Like I always say, I don't like to waste more than five minutes with a woman if she ain't talking about giving me some pussy. This guy said, he wrote me for an email consultation. He said, Alan, I don't even like to waste more than 30 to 60 seconds talking to a woman if she ain't trying to give me no ass. And I was like, damn, you more hardcore than me. I at least give women five minutes. Yeah, he said he said he don't want to talk to a woman for more than a minute if she ain't trying to give him no pussy. Well, I think it takes at least a minute to qualify a woman to find out if she's single, if she's interested in sharing a company. So that's going to take probably a minute right there. But anyway, um, but yeah, man. So, if, yeah, if you favor indirect, but yeah, um, let me see what else before I wrap up. Watch my video podcast. It's paid content, but watch no free attention. It's going to relate to a lot of stuff I'm talking about here. Watch that video podcast, No Free Attention. Um, so yeah, my closing, my closing wrap-up would be 
as far as you guys who believe in this notion of subcommunication, number one, my rebuttal is is bullshit. You don't need to you don't need to subcommunicate to a woman that you want to have sex with her. Here's the deal. You really technically, as far as a woman knowing or if not knowing, at least assuming that you want to have sex with her, you don't have to verbally or non-verbally communicate to a woman that you most women are always gonna assume you want to fuck them. Believe that shit. Nineteen out of every twenty women you meet are always gonna assume you want to fuck them. Why do you think women walk down the street with kind of sometimes like an arrogant look about themselves with this standoffish look. You know why that is? Especially if they know they're good looking and sexy because they assume that every man they come in contact with wants to fuck them. That's why a lot of women walk around looking all arrogant with their head and nose up in the air. They assume that every man who even makes an attempt to, to talk to them and socialize with them wants to fuck them. Most women ain't modest about that shit. Women are fucking shocked if they find out that a guy don't want to put his dick in their mouth. They're fucking shocked. Women assume that every guy they meet wants to put his dick in their mouth. If not their mouth and their pussy. Come on, man. Wake the fuck up. And you think you need to give a woman a certain facial expression to, to let her know that? Again, I'm not going to go into detail because I'm tired of giving y'all shit for free. But the reason why I'm, I'm verbally direct with women is not to communicate that I want to fuck a woman. I know a woman is assuming that already. But my two reasons is this. I want to show her that I got the balls to be verbally direct. If you re reference the conversation I had with that woman in October 1990, that's in my Mo One book, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's number one reason. I want to let a woman know that I'm alpha than a motherfucker. That I got the balls. That I ain't scared to be rejected by. Her. That's number one. And number two, when, you ver when you're verbally direct with women, it allows you to quickly identify the women who don't want to give you some pussy. The manipulative time waster types. That's what it does. That's the two main reasons why I'm verbally direct. I ain't verbally direct because I think I need to let a woman know I want to fuck shit. She know as soon as I approach her that I want to put my dick in her mouth. Women ain't stupid. Well, they stupid about some a lot of shit in life. So let me correct that. Some women are stupid about a lot of shit. There ain't too many women I met that stupid. Man, most women these days, you're talking about girls who are 14, 15, 16, 17, know that most boys who flirt with them want to fuck them or at least get their dick sucked. I mean, come the fuck on, man. Are you serious? Anyway, that my hashtag is going to be an entertaining one today. Go back to the earlier part of this conversation where I said some of you guys are so afraid of rejection that you treat your ego like it's a big Snickers bar that's in your head that a woman's going to lean her mouth into your head and take a big bite out of it. So my hashtag is Snickers bar in your head. I know that's kind of long, but Snickers bar in your head. That's my hashtag for the day. Because that's how a lot of you guys treat rejection. Like a woman going to take a big bite of your Snickers bar, and if 10 women take 10 big bites, that you ain't going to have no more ego left. That's how some of you guys treat the fear of rejection. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys either later on this week or early next week. Take care. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, you're the king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yes. 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 Oh. 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 You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How... 
seductive your intonations are, the vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice, how you could make her pussy so wet just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king. 